So we pray. Open our hearts and minds, O Lord, so that we may hear your word to us today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I guess we made it. We finished with 2022, and we're starting a brand new year, 2023. Now, I'm sure that many of us are glad to be done with 2022, because looking back, we see war in Ukraine, COVID illness, the impact of, of climate change, and no doubt that most of us will be happy to put that all behind us. And we can only hope that 2023 will be an improvement. Today is the beginning of a new year, and we wish each other a happy new year, don't we? But what do we really mean by that? What makes for a happy new year? And what, in fact, makes us happy? What is meaningful for you and for all of us? What does it mean to be, have a happy life? Or for that matter, what is the meaning of life anyway? Now I know that we were supposed to preach about the three wise men and the star that led them to the Christ child, but I thought I would leave that to others and I will try another subject. So how about the meaning of life? Nice, simple subject, right? Wouldn't we all like to know that? Because that may give us some insight in what really makes us happy. So I searched for a text, the part in the Bible that deals with the meaning of life. And I came across the book of Ecclesiastes that has at its heading a wisdom book that wrestles with the meaning of life. So I thought, well, maybe that can help us to wrestle with the meaning of life also. The book of Ecclesiastes is not an easy book. And understanding it is a bit like the story I heard of a blind man who wanted to know what milk was. And he asked the person beside him, and he said, well, milk is a white liquid. He said, oh, but what is white? Well, white is the color of a swan. Oh, but I can't see, so what is a swan? Well, a swan is a bird with a bent neck. Well, but what is bent? So he finally got his arm, he said, look, this is straight and this is bent. He said, oh, thank you. Now I know what milk is. <laughs> now, I admit that I found myself a little bit like this blind man. How many of you have heard about the book of Ecclesiastes? I guess many of you have. But how many have heard preach about it? Maybe not that many. How many of you have actually read it? Well, maybe you've done it as part of a project to read all through the Bible. But how many of you can actually spell it? Now, Lynn remembers that as a child, her church school class had memorized all the books of the Bible. And one Sunday they were asked to recite it before the congregation. And they did some proudly, and when they came to Ecclesiastes, Lynn shouted out loud, Elastics! <laughs> that made some sense to her. And coming to think of it, maybe she had a point. Maybe it is a bit like Elastics, that you can stretch. It's a book written by someone who is old, and looks back at his life and gives us an assessment of what he has learned from his experiences. It begins with this. The word of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, everything is meaningless. Now, no wonder that many don't read beyond that. Who wants to preach about that? Certainly not at the beginning of a new year. Now, if you had a teacher who came into a class and said, started the lesson by saying, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless, would you not be tempted to walk out of the classroom? If you had read a book that started that way, wouldn't you be put off by reading any further? Probably you won't read. You, that's probably why we don't read the book of Ecclesiastes very often either. 
Now the lectionary, which as you know is the three year cycle of biblical passages which most churches use, not the one that Jackie uses, but the one that is used uh, in many churches, doesn't even have Ecclesiastes in it. So why did I select this for, for a reflection today? Well, first of all, I don't like to leave out passages of the Bible just because I don't like them or I find them hard to understand. And secondly, I think there is an important message in this book which is appropriate to talk about on New Year's Day. But let's first back up a little bit and look at the book as a whole. Ecclesiastes means teacher. So who is this teacher? Well, it says that he is the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now to me that can only mean that he is Solomon, the son of David and Bathsheba, who had become king after David. Now Solomon was a very wise man. He was the wisest man who had ever lived. When he first became king, he had a dream. And in this dream, God appeared to him, and God says to Solomon, you can ask for anything you want, and I will give it to you. Imagine that. Imagine anything you want, and you will get it. What would you ask for? Good health, winning the lottery. And Solomon said, well, I want to be the best king I can be, and for that, I need a lot of wisdom because people will come to us with their problems and they will want me to make a ruling. Therefore, I asked for wisdom and God gave him wisdom. And God was pleased that he had asked for wisdom and he said, I will make you wealthy also. And he also became the wealthiest man who ever lived in his day. Now we have the benefit of his wisdom in the book of Proverbs. It's a wonderful book full of wisdom for daily living. And we have the book of Ecclesiastes. So if the book is written by one of the wisest men who ever lived, maybe we should read a little bit further and try to understand what he's saying. By the time Solomon writes the book, he is old and he looks back at his life. He knows that we all live for one purpose, and that is to be happy. That's what we want from our kids, don't we? We say, well, I don't care what you become in life as long as you're happy. And that's what we want for ourselves. That's what we wish for each other at the beginning of a new year. We want you to have a happy new year. That's what we all strive for, right? Well, Solomon says, I did too. I have tried to be happy, and let me tell you, what I have learned about happiness. He says, you work hard all your life, and what for? We all will die one day, and then you can only pass on what you have worked for so hard for some, to someone else. And goodness knows what they will do with it. If you think that this will make you happy, let me tell you, it's meaningless. I'm talking from experience, says Solomon. I have tried it all. I have tried wealth. He was the wealthiest man in the world of his day. He was the Bill Gates of Elon Musk of his day. And he had land and palaces and gold and jewelry. He had armies and staff to work for him. It. You, you name it and he had it. And one day, the Queen of Sheba came to visit him. She was very wealthy herself. And when Solomon showed her around, she said to him, Boy, I, they were told that you were rich, but this is unbelievable. Yet, says Solomon, what I have learned in life, that is not what makes you happy. Solomon said it's all meaningless. Solomon calls it chasing of the wind. Well, there's still a lot of chasing of the wind happening today, isn't there? TV programs which promote that you will become a millionaire are very popular. People are lining up to buy lottery tickets, dreaming that one day they will be wealthy. Yet Solomon says, it is all chasing of the wind. He says in chapter 5, verse 10, whoever loves money never has enough. And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied. Isn't that true? So you see, says Solomon, this too is meaningless. 
Then he says, I've tried wisdom. He said, I've tried, devoted myself to study and explore all that was done under heaven. He said, I thought to myself, I've gone and increased in wisdom more than anyone else. But this too was meaningless and chasing after the wind. He said, even being the wisest man does not make you happy. I don't know if we're ch still chasing after wisdom, are we? Someone did a study of emission statements of American colleges and found out that in the late 20th century, most colleges began their mission statement with that if they studied at their, their college, the students would acquire wisdom. But in the midst of the centuries, colleges have become more modest and said that the college had a mission to provide a place where they dispensed knowledge. And by the end of the century, colleges said that it was their mission to give the students information. So have we given up on wisdom? I think we're all trying to be smart, but that's not the same as being wise. In other cultures, people value older people because of their wisdom. But do we? Are we looking for the wisest person to govern us? Or are we looking for the one who can outsmart the others? Solomon said that he had pursued wisdom. Now, let's back up a minute. I don't for, believe for a moment that Solomon means that being wise isn't good and desirable. In fact, he says this many times in the book of Proverbs, which he calls the book for gaining wisdom and instruction. But, says Solomon, if you believe that this is all you need to make you happy, he said, it's meaningless. Then he said, I tried pleasures. I have hired people to make me laugh. I tried cheering myself up with wine. I undertook great projects such as building houses and planting vineyards. I went into raising cattle. I had more cattle than anyone in the country. I acquired musicians to make music for me and choirs to sing for me. I tried sex and I had a harem greater than anyone before me. Well, it doesn't all sound that bad, does it? But, says Solomon, if you rely on that for your happiness, it's meaningless. You are chasing the wind. Boy, are we chasing the wind still today? Entertainment is one of the largest industries. Sex is used to sell everything else. And we're still bigger, build bigger and better houses and music. Well, everyone has an iPod which holds music of thousands of songs and fits it in your pocket. We're still chasing what Solomon in his days was chasing. And the advertising industry makes us believe that that is all that will make us happy. Well, says Solomon, you're chasing the wind. Now, I don't believe that Solomon says that all these things he had mentioned by themselves are bad. In fact, he calls them gifts from God. And he says there is a time for them. Solomon says in the passage we read this morning, there is a time for everything under the sun and for every activity under heaven. That is the way God has planned it for us. There's a time for laughter, but also for weeping. A time to keep things and a time to give things away. A time to be silent and a time to speak. It's good to keep that in mind sometimes, isn't it? It's a time to love and a time to hate, time for war and a time for peace. See, that's the way the world is. There's a time for everything. Solomon says that is the order of life. For everything, there is a season. And within these polarities, our life takes place. Between these polarities, there is a security in knowing that it is all part of God's plan. Yet, he says, be a wise observation. That might be a wise observation, but what will that do for me in my search for happiness and meaning of life? Now let's look what he says in verse 10. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden that God has laid on man, but I've also seen that God had made everything beautiful in his time. And I've discovered that a God has put eternity in our hearts. God has given us the sense that there is more to life than the things 
we chase. And they have to do with eternity. C.S. Lewis says in his, one of his books that eternity is either true or it is false. And that whether it's true, you believe it's true or false, will determine your priorities in life. It will determine the meaning of your life. If you think eternity doesn't exist, then you can keep on chasing the things that Solomon has tried and they may make you feel good temporarily. And then you go on for some more, hoping that this will make you happy. But we all know that the experience of happiness will become less and less than you have find something else to stimulate you and entertain you. It's all chasing after the wind. But if you believe that eternity is true, then you will have a whole different set of priorities. Now you look for things which will be of value in the light of eternity. Instead of gathering treasures here on earth, you gather treasures in heaven. Instead of looking for temporary happiness, you look for happiness that has no end. You may say, well, yeah, that's very good, but how do I do that? If all the things we think are making us happy are chasing after the wind, according to Solomon, then is there anything that makes us happy? Yes, there is, says Solomon. You can find it in small and little things. What I have discovered, says Solomon, is that two are better than one because they can support each other, they can protect each other, they can keep each other warm. That's what I have discovered. And I've also discovered one more thing. I've discovered that a three-way cord is not easily broken. Now we all know that three strands woven together is much stronger than when they are kept separate. If you want to be truly happy and not chase after the wind, then look around you. Look at what you have and not always want more. Look after each other, help and protect each other. Keep each other out of the cold. And then, says Solomon, you have to bring God in your life. To be happy, you have to weave God into your life. Make him part of all you do. Talk to him, pray to him, tell him what's on your mind. Study his word and seek him into his community. Weave God into your life so that it will be strong. Know that your life is part of God's plan for us and for the whole world. And, God, and Solomon says, even though we cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to end, we have to believe that everything we have is a gift from God. And we should enjoy it, even our work. We should be happy and do good because that's God's will for us. Solomon had everything, money, pleasure, wisdom, power, he had it all. But the conclusion that Solomon comes to at the end of his life is that without God, it is meaningless. Without God, life is meaningless. The only person who can give meaning to our life is God. God is the one who is intimately involved in everything we do and in everything that happens to us. Happiness is to bring our life, our behavior, our actions in line with, with God's plan for the world. To be happy is part of God's plan for us. God wants us to be happy. Jesus came to bring joy to the world. Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And if the world was worth saving, then it must have been valuable to God. If you are worth saving, then you must be valuable to God. Solomon's advice is to live a life in the presence of friendship of others. Have confidence in the knowledge that you are part of God's plan. When we wish each other a happy new year, I wonder what we mean. Do we mean, I hope that you will be successful in your work? That you will finally be able to get the things you always wanted? Get more out of your life and entertainment? Remember, all of that's only temporary. And if that's all you wish for, Solomon said, it's meaningful, meaningless and chasing after the wind. Why would you wish that? Or do you wish a person the happiness that God has planned for us, the happiness that comes from knowing him, 
making God part of your life. Only then you will have the happiness that will last into eternity. So what should we wish each other at the beginning of the new year? I believe that Solomon wants us to enjoy everything the Lord has given us. That he wants us to take life one day at a time. And he wants us to look after each other. Look around you. Support each other. Help each other. And stop chasing after the wind, for that is meaningless, says Solomon. And make God part of all you do in your life. Weave him into the fabric of your life. The prophet Micah in Micah 6, 8 sums it up like this. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And when you do that, you will have a happy new year. To God be the glory. Amen. Our praises, it came upon a midnight clear, 148.